Recently, left wing writer Freddie DeBoer pushed back on a piece that was written by Mark Healy over at New York's Curbed. The piece is titled, How the Mayor's Crackdown on Illegal Mopeds Has Beaten Down Food Delivery Workers. They're mostly cracking down on people doing deliveries. In it, Healy seeks to provide cover for those engaging in illegal actions due to their marginalized status. DeBoer is not fond of that kind of thinking. In fact, if you follow his work, this is a common theme that I actually appreciate and you'll see why in just a moment. So he wrote his response on his Substack, which is one of my favorite Substacks. I am a paid subscriber and I wanna disclose that to the audience. I think it's important for you to know that. DeBoer's response is titled, the marginalized should just be allowed to break the rules is bigoted and unworkable. And we will include a link to that piece in the description box if you'd like to check it out. DeBoer highlights the severe consequences of just allowing people to use illegal mopeds in densely populated parts of the country with impunity, like New York. Now a teenager was just killed after the scooter she was riding on got into a crash with an SUV. Last year, a six year old was struck by a scooter driving illegally in Harlem causing near fatal injuries, including multiple skull fractures. But NYC transplant culture dictates brushing off each and every threat to basic order as a tedious concern of the squares, inspiring the LOL crime school of politics that such people endorse when on their web browsers. I'm willing to guess that they embody a different philosophy when waiting at a low traffic subway station late at night, 100%. Now, DeBoer does not mince words either, writing, are you telling me that a poor brown immigrant from Ecuador can't be expected to meet the standard of not driving their scooter at top speed the wrong way down a one way street that's thick with pedestrians? I'm sorry, but I don't see any non racist way to believe that. Finally, what I appreciate about DeBoer's work, including this very piece, is that even as someone firmly on the left, he's not afraid to critique the strategies of criminal justice reformers. Most of the people who had recently advocated for defunding the police stopped doing so. But antipathy towards the police remained and powered many lefty debates, understandably, given how much there is to criticize in American policing. No particular vision of responsible and achievable criminal justice reform coalesced though. Because that's hard and everybody mostly wanted to move on. As I said recently, in an incredibly short time frame, most people in media went from cosplaying as Black Panthers on Twitter to a stance of, look, this is all very embarrassing. I'm tired, can we not talk about this? And this has been a pretty big disaster in many large liberal cities, including my own place of residence, Los Angeles. We're left in this space where there's a reflexive anti-authority instinct, endless amounts of LOL crime, LOL, 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 and no actual tangible adult position on how to deal with law and order issues in a free society. All coming from people who self identify as left of center, which means they should be inherently aligned with the concept of good government. Joining us now to talk about this piece and more is the man himself, Freddie DeBoer. Freddie, thank you so much thanks. for joining us. Thanks for having me. I, again, just wanna tell you that I appreciate your work and you're one of the individuals who basically forced me to think about these types of issues a lot more critically. Um, I'm gonna raise my hand and say that I was part of the media that was super gung ho with the defund the police crowd because you look at the disparity in policing, you look at the way that people of color are treated in this country. And yeah, it disgusts you and you want to support any effort to change that. But as you point out, there are some issues that could actually lead the pendulum to swing back to a tough on crime direction. And in fact, we are seeing that in some liberal cities that had loosened up some laws and in states like Oregon. Pausing here to deliver some honest truth as we do in our news coverage as well. TYT is facing challenges, guys, as the entire industry is. You know who could make the difference? You. If you hit the join button below, it's gonna make all the difference and keep us in business. We appreciate you, thank you. So the first question I wanna ask you is, why did you decide to 
focus on the moped issue for your argument in this piece, because I think a lot of people would look at that and be like, ah, it's not a big deal. Well, I think that first of all, it's just a uh, it's a big deal in the sense that these are many thousands of interactions that are happening all over the city. Uh, every time someone on an e-bike or a moped or a scooter is on the sidewalk uh, and <clears throat> very nearly comes uh, close to hitting someone. And that's a real quality of life issue that affects a lot of people all the time. Um, I also think that um, with this particular uh, sort of framing of it in the North New York Magazine piece, you really have a sort of classic example of what contemporary liberalism just kind of can't wrap its hands around, which is you have a genuinely unsafe set of behaviors that are being committed by People who genuinely are marginal, who are linguistically marginal and economically, and there many of them are undocumented immigrants. Um, and the fundamental point that I have to make is the answer cannot be that we're just going to let people do whatever they want if we think that they're marginalized. Of course, these delivery guys are highly sympathetic. And I think a lot of the blame lies on the feet of the delivery companies that don't pay them by the hour, but pay them by the delivery, which necessitates them driving like madmen all over the city. But fundamentally, just the idea that, okay, these people cannot be expected to follow basic rules and laws that keep the rest of us safe depends on the notion that they're incapable of doing so, which as I say in the piece is a deeply racist notion. You know, it reminds me of what happened in the Culver City School District in, you know, LA, where they decided, okay, look, there's a lack of Latino students in our advanced placement classes or our honors classes. And because of that, we're just gonna scrap the honors classes altogether. Which to me is an incredibly racist way of handling it because it's just this assumption that, you know, the students can't rise to the occasion. You know, how about approach it from a mindset of what can we do to lift these students up, right? And so when it comes to, you know, that type of thinking in the, you know, law and order sense, it's the same feel, like like we're expected marginalized people to behave a certain way. And I, I just have higher expectations for people. And I think that we can reform uh, our criminal justice system in a way that's actually beneficial for everyone. It includes the uh, individuals who could be reformed, it could uh, or rehabilitated. It includes justice for the victims. But you know, I'm curious, have you seen any examples of efforts to reform policing that's been effective or maybe reforms to the prison system? Well, I think that we have the framework for that, which is the George Floyd Justice and Policing Bill. It was a big omnibus police reform bill. The fact that it was happening at the federal level kind of limited what it could do given how local policing is, but it contained lots of great provisions related to body cameras and to banning <clears throat> choke holds and to just many, many different things. Small bore, but if you add them all together, they become a big deal, these reforms. Um, unfortunately, the George Floyd Justice and Policing uh, Bill got, got middled because the Republicans are always going to hate it because they're going to be pro cop no matter what. And at the time, um, a lot of the activist class sort of dismissed it as a uh, watered down compromise. Uh, this was at the time when everyone was talking about a reckoning and how uh, small measures weren't going to work. Uh, and so it didn't have the left wing champions that it needed and it died twice in Congress. Um, but that's what it's gonna take. Unfortunately, there's no one you know, magic policy change that we can enact uh, to you know, fix American policing. It's gonna take a lot of small changes over time in many places, uh, which means that we have to be number one, uh, committed to actually looking at what the data and the evidence tells us. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to be <laughs> committed to uh, not uh, thinking that we're gonna solve all of these problems immediately. Um, but you know, at the moment that all of that stuff was happening, uh, when you know Nancy Pelosi is wearing tinte cloth and kneeling in the halls of Congress, um, that nobody wanted to hear about reform. Yeah, I mean, you make a great point there because I think a lot of those reforms were good ideas, but I feel like the criminal justice reform movement was, to some extent, kind of co-opted with like this anarchist flavor. And by individuals who suddenly were promoting, you know, maximalist solutions in their minds, like prison abolition. 
And so am I kind of exaggerating that or did you notice that as well? Well, I think there's there's two things to say immediately. The first is that like don't underestimate the fact that like defund the police was something, right? In other words, people were casting around for something, for anything. And again, um, you know, criminal justice reform isn't like reforming uh, the American medical system where you can say Medicare for all will utterly change the system and they're going to fix a ton of problems. Criminal justice reform, there just isn't that one thing. And so, you know, anti, you know, is the sort of police abolition or prison abolition stuff that goes back a very long way. And so there was this pre existing sort of set of attitudes about it that people could grab onto. I think a lot of people grabbed onto it because they didn't know what else to do. But I, I do want to say, like you mentioned anarchism, right? Mm-hmm. This is one of the things that really drives me crazy, which is that if you talk to most of the sort of young lefties who have been minted, let's say since 2016, right? If you, if you, if you talk to um, people who became socialist or, or came out as socialist or developed socialist identity, um, you know, that's what they'll say. They'll say that they'll, they tend to identify as socialist. But there's, there's no engagement with the fact that socialism and anarchism are, are two different things. Like there's, there's this constant tendency to say, well, okay, Reform of policing is a sort of liberal or you know not as far left sort of idea, whereas just getting rid of it all, that's the left idea. But that's not the left idea, all right? You can go back through hundreds of years of left theory of what the proper role of the police are in the state. Many very far left societies have also been quite authoritarian when it comes to law and order. And it just, it just speaks to the sense in which, you know, we recruited a lot of soldiers in, in the last eight or so years, and, I, and I'm happy for that. But many of them just don't have the backing in the theory that underlies these positions. And so you get these sort of <clears throat> this constant slippages like anarchism and socialism are the same thing when in fact, that's been the biggest division within the far left for hundreds of years. Yeah, and you know, you make a really great point in your piece about how it's important for the left to pursue policies that show how government works, how government can be helpful and beneficial to your life. I'm not talking about you know overreaching actions by the government, but I'm talking about funding things like, let's say public parks or public transportation. Actually, public transportation is a good topic to just touch on right now because you know, there is a problem in places like LA with people who typically would use public transportation no longer wanting to because there's been this permissive attitude toward drug use. And I'm talking about hard drugs, like people literally smoking methamphetamine on the train, which bothers people. You don't wanna inhale that, you don't wanna see that. And so when the government just allows that to happen with impunity, well then it, kind of signals to the population that government's ineffective and they don't really know how to do their jobs. I think that's mm-hmm. pretty damaging, no? Oh, totally. And I mean like I think like you know public transportation in New York is a very good example, which is just that um it costs money. In order for that money to be secured, you need to have riders who are paying the fare and you need to have tax dollars. In order to have tax dollars, you have to have people who are enthusiastic about taking the train and to have people who are enthusiastic about taking the train, the trains have to be safe. And it is so mind boggling to me, the the notion that talking about train safety is somehow some sort of like liberal squished position. Everyone should have the right to travel in clean, effective, safe public transportation. Um, I was uh, horrified by the killing of Jordan Neely, and uh, I've written a bunch about it. Um, <clears throat> I uh, have been incredibly frustrated by the way that his death has been discussed in much of these uh, of these uh, discussions because. Um, the presumption from so many people writing in the media is that the two choices what were either Jordan Neely got choked to death on a, the floor of a train, or uh, he should just be free to wander around psychotic, emaciated, smoking synthetic marijuana, 
committing at random acts of violence. Those are not the choices, right? But the only way to be able to save someone like Jordan Neely and a lot of other people is if you have a government that is willing to use force in order to help them. And again, I just I I don't know where the notion that to be on the left means that you think the government should never use force in any capacity. I don't know where that came from. And you can contrast it with all kinds of regulation, right? We stand for good government. We stand for regulatory systems that ensure that things happen in a way that is beneficial to society. And regulation always comes at the barrel of a gun. Yes, I. what happened to Jordan Neely was a disgrace and a complete failure by local government. And you know the argument that you'll typically hear from lefties is, well, it's because government failed to get him the mental health care he needed. But that's not actually correct because due to other crimes he had committed previously, which could be tied to his mental health condition, he was given the option to either go to prison or go to inpatient mental health care. So he obviously chose the latter, that's a way better option. But unfortunately, he was just able to walk out. And right. that's not mandatory inpatient mental health treatment. <laughs> that's the opposite of that. And so, you know, you yourself have openly spoken about and written about your own mental health, you know, condition and how that experience has led you to your opinion that there should be forced uh, inpatient treatment for people. Uh, can you elaborate on that a little more? Yeah, sure. So, um, <clears throat> uh, in, in forced treatment, right? Involuntary treatment saved my life. Um, I would not be here without it. Just literally would not be here. Um, I, you know, uh, when I have been psychotic, I have been forced into treatment in a way that has saved my life and potentially the lives of others. Um, <clears throat> You know, I wrote a piece for the Daily Beast about Jordan Neely, and I said, you know, uh, involuntary commitment could have saved uh, <clears throat> Jordan Neely's life. And after it came out, I stuck it into the search bar on Twitter to see what people were saying. Oof. And person after person after person said, well, actually, maybe that guy could just not kill him. To which the answer is, okay, maybe he, if he didn't kill him, Jordan Neely would still be rotting to death on that train, right? Like he, he was in a state that was, or he was going to die of something sooner or later because he was so unhealthy. Um, these activists, disability activists who I fight with all the time, they love to talk about autonomy and freedom and independence, but there is no autonomy or freedom or independence when your brain is being hijacked by a defect of neurochemistry. Like I, I am not free when I am psychotic, I am quite the opposite of free. And I, I think it's really important that people at home know if they don't, um, we have been making it harder to involuntarily treat people for 60 plus years. There has been a whole string of policy choices, of laws passed, of court decisions that have made it harder and harder and harder to compel someone to get care when they really need it. And part of the wreckage of all this are families who desperately want their loved ones to take their medications and stay in treatment. And we have not created the policy atmosphere where it's possible to force them to when they really need to be forced. What would you say to those who push back against your argument here and say, well, we've already had experiences with the asylums of yesteryear and they were awful. The conditions were terrible, people were mistreated and we don't want to go back to that. Cuz that is a common argument or counterpoint that people make. Uh, sure, um, some of the asylums certainly were awful. Uh, it's not the case that all of them were. Unfortunately, when you talk to people about this, um, their reference point is almost always a handful of movies. Um, there is no attempt to sort of access actual historical data on this question. Uh, you know, if I ever hear someone refer to one flew over the cuckoo's nest one more time, I'm I'm going to lose it. Um, the reality is that yes, there were absolutely many things about the asylums that were ugly and undesirable. But again, we started the deinstitutionalized process and a ton of people were not shepherded out of the asylums into you know, autonomous and successful lives. They just ended up on the streets. It is, it is incredible to me that people think that sleeping under a bridge 
uh, is somehow better than uh, being an inpatient in an asylum. Of course, we need to always put uh, patient safety and patient rights as a, a paramount part of all of this. But and the reality is these people cannot define another possible way in which we might save these people than through compelling treatment. The, the fundamental issue, you said it yourself about Jordan Neely, he was diverted out after randomly assaulting a 60 plus year old person for no reason. He was diverted out of jail through a mental health treatment program, which is exactly what we want and what, what, what liberals want. But as you said, he just walked out the door. And if we're actually, if we actually want to be humane, we have to come up with a systemic solution to a systemic problem, which everybody talks about all the time now is systemic solutions. But you can't just say the word programs, right? I mean, so often when I get into these debates with people who are opposed to involuntary commitment, I say, what should happen? What could we have done to save Jordan Neely? What could we do to save the people? Uh, who are currently dying of gangrenous limbs in uh, under park benches somewhere. Uh, and they say, oh, just well, we need more programs. There needs, there needs to be government funding, there needs to be programs. The problem is, is none of that stuff matters if these people are treatment resistant because of their mental illness. Uh, it is a very common feature of psychotic disorders that they prevent people from being able to understand that they're sick. And if your solution is just give them voluntary programs, the problem is that's tried many places, it's been tried for many years. Uh, and if you can't compel people to stay in their treatment, they're just gonna end up on the streets again. Freddie, I could talk to you all day. There's so much work that you've put out there that I'm appreciative of, appreciative of, and I'm very appreciative that you came on the show today and discussed these controversial topics with us. Everyone, please go check out Freddie DeBoer's Substack. I promise you will not be disappointed. And Freddie, thank you again for coming on to speak with us. I hope you'll come back soon. Thanks for having me. Thanks for watching. If you become a member, you get to watch all this ad-free, except for, of course, this ad. Still, hit the join button below.